Hi, I'm Chao Wei Huang from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and Frederick Health Hospital. Today we're going to talk about a common dilemma uh, for interventional cardiologists in uh, cardiac arrest patients. How long should you wait to do the ECG post ROSC to decide whether or not it is a STEMI? So here is a not so infrequent scenario. Uh, the patient is a 50 year old man uh, with no known medical history who had a witnessed arrest after grabbing his chest outside a furniture store. Fortunately, a nurse happened to be nearby and she started CPR immediately. Uh, EMS arrived quickly and the patient was in VF. He got four shocks, three rounds of epi, an amiobolus, he was intubated. He did remain in VF and the Lucas device was applied. He did not achieve ROSC until after he arrived to the ED for a total downtime of about 20 minutes. Now in the ED, he was unresponsive, he was hypertensive and tachycardic, and his oxygen saturation was 100% on the ventilator. And here's the immediate post-ROSC ECG. Uh, the patient is in sinus tachycardia, and there's clear ST elevation uh, in lead AVL. Um, there are also ST depressions uh, in the inferior leads. So um, you're the interventionist on call, and you get a call from the ED asking you to take this patient to the cath lab. Well, it seems like a reasonable request, right? After all, uh, we have a resuscitated um, VF arrest patients with an ECG that shows ST elevation. Granted, it's only one lead, uh, but the patient is young, uh, just 50 years old. So should you just activate the cath lab? Now, um, there is certainly a lot of recent data looking at when it's appropriate to take cardiac arrest patients directly to the lab. In fact, I did a uh, video about this, and you may want to check it out if you haven't already. I've included the link below. The uh, punchline is that for cardiac arrest patients without ST elevation, shock, or refractory arrhythmia, um, immediate cardiac catheterization had no benefit, and there was even a trend toward harm. So whether there is ST elevation or not is critical in our decision to take an arrest patient to the lab. So um, does all this apply here? Well, yes and no. The uh, patient's post ross ECG does show ST elevation, but, and here's the key, the immediate post ross ECG can sometimes be quite misleading. That's because global hypoperfusion from cardiac arrest uh, can cause the ECG to show ST elevation even without underlying CAD. We've all seen how funny looking uh, post ROSC ECGs can sometimes look. And as myocardial perfusion normalizes a little while after ROSC, the ST elevations can sometimes resolve. So many interventionalists will wait and repeat the ECG before taking a patient to the lab. But how long do you wait? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes? Well, there was actually a study uh, published in 2021 looking at this exact question. Uh, this was a European multi-center um, retrospective study, uh, which involved 370 patients uh, resuscitated from out-of-hospital arrest who underwent coronary angiography. Um, they looked at the percentage of false positive ECGs after ROSC, uh, by which they met the percentage of patients with post-ROSC ECG showing STEMI, but who ended up having no obstructive CAD on cath. Um, they also looked at uh, what the optimal time interval was uh, to wait after ROS to do an ECG uh, so that uh, the false positive rate can be minimized. In their study, uh, about two thirds of cardiac arrest patients without ST elevations on their ECG actually had obstructive CAD. This is pretty much in line with other, uh, other uh, cardiac arrest studies. And of those, most uh, received PCI. And um, not surprisingly, uh, over 90% of patients uh, with ST elevations on the ACG had obstructive CAD, and most of those uh, received PCI. And here is the punchline. Uh, the STEMI false positive rate in ECGs performed immediately after ROSC is 18.5% in this study. And waiting eight minutes uh, reduced that false positive rate by more than 60%. Waiting more than 33 minutes did not uh, reduce the false positive rate any further. And interestingly, these time intervals were not affected by the use of epinephrine, by the heart rate, by the QRS morphology, by the number of shocks before ROSC, by the gender or by the patient's age. 
So back to our patient. Uh, we uh, decided to get another ECG at the 10 minute mark. And as you can see here already, the ST elevation AVL has already, uh, already markedly improved to the point that we felt it no longer qualified as a STEMI. So therefore, based on uh, the data from COACT and from Tomahawk, uh, we made the decision not to take this patient directly to the cath lab. The uh, patient was admitted to the ICU, and the ICU admission ECG, which you see here at roughly 90 minutes post ROSC, actually showed even further normalization of the ST segments. So uh, what happened to the patient? Well, as it turns out, uh, he had a history of polysubstance abuse and tested positive for cocaine. Uh, he did regain consciousness and was extubated the next day. His troponin peaked at 10.2. Uh, we did eventually take him to the lab and he ended up having non-obstructive CAD. All right, uh, take home messages. Um, the key here is to remember that ECGs done um, immediately post ROS can be misleading because of the global myocardial hypoperfusion that is inherent in cardiac arrest. The false positive rate for STEMI uh, in uh, immediate post ROS ECGs can be as high as 18.5%. Waiting eight minutes uh, can reduce the false positivity rate by more than 60%. So, um, you know, for me, I do think it's reasonable uh, to continue to aim to get an ECG as quickly as possible after ROS, because if it does show STEMI, uh, if it does not show STEMI at that point, then it's probably not a STEMI. But if it does show STEMI, then it does seem prudent to repeat it again at eight minutes uh, to confirm that it is in fact a STEMI before making the decision to take the patient to the cath lab. Thank you for watching.